Hello, and welcome to Conversations on Europe Teachable Moments, a program brought to you by the European Study Center at the University of Pittsburgh. I am Alison Delnor, the director of that center, and today I'm joined by Professor Jeanette Dweely of the Department of Religious Studies here at Pitt. Dr. Dweely has been invited to discuss the recent Burkini controversy that started in France this summer as a result of a handful of mayors of small French towns and coastal cities banning the wearing of the so-called burkini on French public beaches. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> to start out, can we set the stage a little bit and can you talk about what is exactly is a burkini and why has it become the center of controversy in France? Yeah, so the burkini is a sort of wetsuit but lighter made out of a uh, swimsuit material and it was designed by an Australian Muslim woman who wanted to provide Muslim women with uh, something that is practicable to, to wear and that covers the, the body and the head, um, leaving hands, feet and face open uh, so to respect uh, uh, the modesty requirements for observant Muslim women but at the same time being uh, better than wearing full clothes when you go into the sea so that you can have a better experience while swimming. Mm -hmm. um, why it has become the center of controversy? Um, well, it, it has been outlawed by um, the mayor mayors, as you mentioned before, and um, that has been kind of an in unprecedented step in um, now regulating um, clothes on public land, right? Is this ban, I mean, we've heard about in the news, the recent attacks that have happened in France and Belgium and elsewhere in Europe, of course, is this ban been tied in any way to the recent attack in Nice that happened on July 14th? Of course, the fact that you had these kind of attacks kind of legitimates um, the idea of um, you know, having a strong hand on Muslim communities who are considered to be a potential threat in France and especially because um, in France since the Charlie Hebdo shooting, so um, January 2015, there has been a consistent link being made by French politicians between um, terrorism, violent extremism and a conservative form of Islam. So pundits, uh, public intellectuals, and politicians have explicitly, repeatedly made this connection. So in this sense, once this connection was made, there's of course the, um, the, the kind of proof that we are doing something against violent extremism because we are um, destroying it at the roots, and the roots of it is conservative or you know, traditional orthodox kind of Islam. So in addition to these security arguments, the justifications for the ban as they've been made have revolved around these you know, sort of tributes to French Republican values, especially laïcité, which we traditionally um, translate as secularism. But in America, secularism wouldn't seem, it would seem to protect a woman's right to wear whatever religious clothing she wanted to wear. So what's going on in France that's different? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in, in, in the US, of course, secularism is very clearly tied to the idea of um, uh, limiting the state's power in uh, interfering in the religious freedom of a citizen, whereas in, in, in France, um, laïcité is much more concerned with, um, with uh, guaranteeing the state's prerogative to delineate a proper religious space and a space that is very clearly under the tutel of the state, that is not really autonomous and that is not uh, in competition with the state. So um, Lysteria has, of course, uh, now a over 100 years old history. A key moment was the 1905 law of the separation of the church and state. Um, at that time, uh, I cannot go into details in the, into that, but at, at that time it was especially about uh, limiting the power of the Catholic Church um, and uh, limiting its influence in social life, poli public life, political life. Um, in the last 20 years, interestingly, the main concerns of any kind of laic striving has been really um, Islam and limiting the imagined um, power 
of Islam and 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 and, um, and keeping it out of the public space. Um, of course, uh, no, with for us understanding that it's about a religious minority, and not something that had, you know, in any sense, the equal power to the Catholic st uh, Church at the uh, end of the 19th, beginning of 20th century. So there's a quite different understanding nowadays, um, or there's a quite different understanding, quite different definition of what laicity is than what an American would imagine. And nowadays, really, it is imagined as keeping a certain kind of religion out of the public s institutions, out of the public s sphere, and privatizing it to an extent possible. Interesting. You mentioned that there was, um, that this is part of a longer trend that's yes. been happening. So other than the Burkini, has there been other bans on religious attire in France? Yes, of course. So very important, of course. Um, this is a, a kind of um, ongoing succession of bans. The first real ban uh, being an affected in um, 2004, uh, outlawing um, um, ostentatious religious symbols. Um, this has been the consequence of 20 years of debates previously, and this, uh, this, out, this interdiction uh, was geared at public schools, state-funded public schools, um, where there should not be uh, ostentatious religious symbols um, worn, and that was especially, um, of course, also um, geared towards the hijab of schoolgirls. Um, then there were a couple of other smaller affairs um, because that, of course, opens a whole new of <laughs> bag of worms. So um, then the question was, can mothers who accompany their children to school trips, uh, can they uh, wear a headscarf or not because they are now working within this framework of schools, can uh, women who work in daycare wear, wear hijab or not. So there had, has been not a national law, but there have been initial, uh, initial um, uh, in the local um, arrangements or, or interdictions and so on. Um, then, of course, in the 2010, there was uh, what has been called the Burqa ban. So face veils have been um, forbidden. Um, now, it's my understanding that those bans were basically upheld by the French courts, and even the, um, the European Court of Justice upheld the ban on the burqa ban in public spaces. Um, but this burkini ban was actually struck down pretty quickly by the French Conseil d'État, the, the highest court in France. So what, what has made this particular ban different in the eyes of at least the French justices, the courts? Yes, so um, the first one, 2004, was in the framework of public schools that, according to the Republican ideology, are to be secular, religiously neutral, and um, whereas there was a debate, should the neutrality be demanded from teachers or from students, because in the past, the Republican-like school uh, was constructed around the idea that teachers should be neutral. Now the requirement of neutrality was demanded from the students as well. But because there was this strong sense of the school, the laic schools being the sanctuary of the republic, and it was in a very limited space of that school environment, of that in particular institution, it was deemed um, upholdable and in tune with, with French constitutional values. Now, um, 2010 um, was of course different in the sense that it um, now didn't concern a particular institutional space or particular buildings, but it was being taken to the streets, if you want, and uh, it concerned uh, individuals covering their faces in the street. This was, however, upheld with the idea of um, security, of course, in the context also of, um, of um, terrorist attacks and so on, with the idea that the state has to see the face and in identify the faces of its citizens in case there is a criminal act you have to see the face of the citizen so that was the kind of um, rationale that uh, that that weighed in, in terms of security so, uh, visibility and public order um, that 
that primed over concerns for um, a particular individual freedom. Now here you have really something that um, that um, that that is unprecedented in, in terms of interfering in choices of how people want to wear clothes. Um, of course, this has happened before that individual swimming pools would say we don't want, this is you know, against the swimming etiquette in a particular swimming pool or against the hygiene or something else. But here it's public land and people are walking basically as they, they, they just <laughs> walking around as they usually walk around. And the interesting thing, of course, with the picture of the woman who, um, uh, who's, uh, with the picture which got, got viral with the woman being kind of forced to undress by, mm -hmm. by the French police of that town, was that she actually was not even wearing a bikini, but she was just wearing her regular clothes, just not being in, in a bikini or a swimsuit. Right, so so you see the the kind of confusions, and that of course um, interferes with any idea of uh, individual freedom to dress on a public land how you want. So tell me, has France imposed similar restrictions on any other religious groups? Um, again, a good question. Um, if you take strictly the um, the, the phrasing of the laws. Um, especially when, with regard to the 204 law, um, it was a very neutral language. All of the laws ha have adopted a neutral language. They never singled out explicitly uh, Muslim religious dress. Um, the 2004 law um, outlawing um, ostentatious religious um, gear or dress um, in, in the secular school um, also affected um, observing Jewish boys wearing the yarmulke or, or kippah, and also um, Sikh boys who have a sort of t turban. Um, the difference uh, with these two other communities was that A, for uh, observant uh, Jewish children, there was already a tradition of religious private schools. So a minority of religious Jewish kids would actually go to the secular public school and they could immediately um, transfer to an existi existing well-developed well school system. Um, the Sikh boys didn't have that. Um, also a more recent uh, religious minority like, like Muslims. Um, but the number is is very marginal if you compare that to the population of Muslims in, in France. So um, they have been also affected by that. I've heard that various families actually after that migrated to the UK where they already had um, family connections. Um, but because the number was so uh, minor, it has not um, become such an uh, uh, kind of politicized issue. And the, 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 the fact of the matter was, of course, that the, um, that the law was geared towards Muslim headscarves. This is why we talked you know, for the fa past 20 years or ab about several headscarf affairs, right? The L'Affaire du Voile. In many of these instances, it seems that the discriminatory legislation has had to be struck down by the courts, which suggests that the protection of individual rights that's basic idea behind 19th century liberalism, right, is being done at the expense sometimes at the will of the people. You know, if you went strictly democratically, they, they're not trying to protect everybody's individual rights. So what does this say about the future of liberal democracies such as ours, which are based on those two fundamental values, individual rights and majority rules? Are they, are they in balance? <laughs> <laughs> That's a broad question. Um, what I do think, of course, is, is, is essential in the understanding of contemporary democracies is that the will of the people um, can sometimes be dangerous, especially after the Second World War. Um, Hitler, of course, was voted <laughs> democratically into power. Um, and that there is a sense of every democracy needs to protect its minorities because they are vulnerable and we cannot just rely 100% on a majority rule, but it has to be always kind of um, um, delineated by some core substantial values like uh, minority protection, civil freedoms, religious freedoms, and civic freedoms, religious freedoms, and so on. But of course, we see that, especially 
in um, liberal democracies, if you will, um, for the last 40 years, minorities have been very vocal in using that framework to promote their protection and their, their empowerment or their, their, their rights. So I think that will not go away, and that's a good thing, obviously. Yeah, things to think about. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule, and thank you all for joining us. If you're interested in other teachable moments, please check out our webpage for conversations on Europe, and we will also have additional resources to accompany this discussion. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>